Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to Spine Time, our bi-weekly webinar where we tackle all the important questions that affect spinal health. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm the Director of Spinal Neurosurgery at Weill Cornell and of the Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. And today we're going to talk about the spine-mind connection, how your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, attitudes can influence spinal health. This is a topic that I've been really looking forward to with great excitement and curiosity over the last few weeks. And uh, I'm happy to have two excellent speakers and two excellent uh, clinicians here who are going to enlighten us on the mind-spine uh, spine connection. A few words about the Spine Center. Uh, at Weill Cornell, as you know, we are a multidisciplinary center where we bring together not only surgeons, and we have neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons, but also pain management, sports medicine, psychology, spinal uh, surgery, complementary medicine. So we're trying to really tackle all the aspects that may affect a person's spinal, but also mental, mental health, because those are connected, as we'll find out during this webinar. The speakers today are Josh Weaver, who's one of the co-directors of the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care here at Cornell. He's assistant professor of clinical neurology. And Dr. Robert Allen, who's a clinical assistant professor of psychology and medicine at Weill Cornell. We've been working with Dr. Allen for many years in the Spine Center. Josh Weaver is one of our co-directors. Together, I think we'll have a very, very lively and very interesting discussion on the topic. And uh, I want to start out by setting the stage. As surgeons, we deal with body parts and with the physical aspect of disease. And we know that obviously the spine is closely connected to really every other organ in the body. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bones, uh, the skeleton, uh, osteoporosis, tumors, infection, trauma, all these things can really affect spinal health. But there's much more to spinal health than just physiology or uh, physics. It's also the mind. And that's what we're trying to really explore today. And when I was thinking about how to get this started, I uh, was thinking about one of my you know, favorite authors, uh, Marcus Aurelius, who said many years ago, for times when you feel pain, pain is neither unbearable nor unending, as long as you keep in mind its limits and don't magnify them in your imagination. And keep in mind, too, that pain often comes in disguise, as drowsiness, fever, loss of appetite. When you're bothered by things like that, remain, remind yourself, I'm giving in to pain. And I think that very nicely kind of sets the stage for our discussion, and I would like to maybe ask uh, Dr. Allen to get started and talk to us a little bit about what he does in the spine and in the mind and pain arena. What's his experience, what his expertise? And maybe you wanna say a few words about Marcus Aurelius as well, because I know you're very uh, educated and uh, you're very curious. You have a very curious mind. Well, thank you so much, Roger. Um, what I do is try to talk to people as people and find out how they manage their pain psychologically. A lot of our thinking happens automatically and we're not really aware of our thoughts. In fact, there was a New York Times article recently that, that stated that about 50% of our thoughts occur automatically. We don't, really, we, we don't really notice them, they just go by. And if you have an automatic thought that is negative, it's gonna have some impact on your life and it's gonna have some impact on your pain as well. So if I think my pain is never going to go away, as uh, our friend Marcus uh, indicated, how is that going to make me feel? If I feel it, if I think to myself, this is the worst thing in the whole world, um, how is that going to affect me? So I ask patients and I ask myself as well, um, if you discover that you're all of a sudden feeling down or um, blue or focused on your pain, try to trace your thoughts, try to trace your thoughts back. What was I just thinking? Was I just thinking that this is unbearable? It's never gonna get better. My life is ruined. Uh, when you have those kinds of all or none thoughts, 
it makes you, it makes you, it exacerbates your pain, it makes it worse. And in many cases, it makes you depressed. So Robert, that's very interesting. So, um, and we'll have Josh say a few words maybe also just to kind of introduce his background and his expertise. But what you said just brings up a lot of questions that I would have, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait a few minutes. Maybe we'll have Josh talk about what he does. And again, Josh is a professor of uh, neurology here at Weill Cornell, and he's one of the co-directors of the Spine Center. And he sees a lot of the patients that we see here on a daily basis and gives us valuable input in terms of the neurology of pain. And uh, Josh, what, what's, tell, tell us a little bit more about what you do. That intro, Roger. So yeah, I am, I am a uh, neurologist uh, working in the Spine Center. And, you know, I always find this, this mind-body connection or mind-spine connection in this case to be really fascinating. Um, I put this picture up here because there's, a, there's another old uh, philosopher. So Descartes always had, there's this duality of, of mind and brain, right? And I personally think as a neurologist, it's really not two separate things. You know, what we feel, our emotions, what we perceive, and also all of the other functions that the brain does structurally are really all together the same thing. And I think, I think our emotions are, there are very specific parts of the brain that, that um, uh, you know, control our emotions. And there are neurochemicals and, and receptors and proteins um, that are in the brain that are mediating all of these things. And they're very intricately involved with pain um, and how we perceive pain, um, that circuitry overlaps. And so as a neurologist, I always think about, you know, the, the ability of our mind to control certain aspects of our brain, of our body, and what we feel is, is just actually very obvious. I think it's, I think it happens in all of us. Um, and I, I don't believe in this duality. I think they're all, you know, this, this mind and, and soul and, and uh, you know, um, brain, I think is all one thing. Um, and so as a neurologist, I try to uh, evaluate people physically, but I also take some time to talk to people about their emotions and about how they're feeling. And we talk about, you go to the next slide, um, there's a lot of mind-body practices that people can use. And I just put up a lot of funny little cute pictures here, but you know, um, meditation, uh, prayer, um, talking to a psychologist, um, mindfulness, as Dr. Allen was talking about, um, yoga, tai chi, music therapy, art therapy. There are so, so many different ways that we can access um, the mind and actually harness that ability to control pain. Um, and I just, I just think it's a really fascinating topic and we're learning more and more as we go, as we go on. Um, but it's, a, it's something that I think could be really powerful. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, maybe back to Dr. Allen. I was wondering when I was listening to you, 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 for for patient, I'm just picturing the patients that I see in the office. They come to my to my office, and they're in in real, true and and severe pain sometimes. And how do you how do you make a patient understand though that now you're telling them it's really your thoughts, it's your interpretation of of what's going on in your body that makes you suffer. How do you explain to a patient, how, how does that really work? Because a patient who is in pain, I would think, if I was in pain, I would think, well, I'm really in pain. It's really terrible. How do you make that bridge? Or is, is, that, is that something that takes time? Do you have to see somebody multiple times to kind of make that understand? Or does it depend on the patient's kind of uh, upbringing and thought processes? Or, or how do you teach someone to separate the pain from the thought processes? So... Um, pain is pain. It's real. And uh, as you know, I, I got involved with this group because of my own pain, my own sciatica. And it's, it, it, really, it really feels bad, right? But if you say to yourself, it's terrible, does that make you feel better or worse? So it's our thoughts about the pain that um, either exacerbate it or allow us to adjust to it uh, more easily. No matter what, uh, I can't take away a patient's pain, uh, but I can help people adjust to it um, by uh, some of the techniques that Dr. Weaver just put up on the, on the board, mindfulness, meditation, uh, music, anything that can distract you from your pain uh, will, will help. 
it will it will alleviate it to certain to a certain degree. Distraction is uh, arguably the best uh, psychological medicine for pain. If I yeah, can comment on that on that too. Yeah. I'm sorry, Roger. Um, no, go ahead. I I actually. Um, I love the, the how you said you know pain is real, right? Um, and that's a really important thing. It sounds it sounds kind of obvious, but um, you know you could have a pain generator in the spine. You could have a disc herniation that's pushing on a nerve, right? Um, but the the reason we feel that pain is because we're perceiving it up here in the brain, right? And often we have situations where we have people who had surgery, let's say, and they decompress the area and everything looks great and the nerves aren't getting squished anymore and there shouldn't be any pain anymore. And somehow that pain persists and continues, even though we don't have a good explanation for it physically. But I think the explanation is because there's something going on in the brain where that perception of pain is still happening and still very real. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people will tell me, um, yes, I have pain, but I'll tell you, whenever I get stressed out, the pain gets worse. Whenever I get anxious about whatever, the pain gets worse. I think a lot of people know that there's that connection that's there. They'll even volunteer that connection, you know? And so I, I do think that a lot of these therapies uh, can lead to distraction from pain, but I would argue that a lot of these therapies also activate certain areas of the brain or even deactivate other areas of the brain. And I do think that that there is a physiological change that occurs with some of these treatments um, where you can start to see changes in the neurochemistry or nerve receptors. And I think that also helps with the pain. There's, there's a comment about meditation. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Or sure. Maybe, Actually, yeah. With meditation, you can see structural changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's actually not such new data. Um, but getting back to what Dr. Weaver was talking about, it's not just the, the, the pain that, the, the pain that's the issue. In many cases, people just don't know how to live all that well, you know? So if you have somebody who is in a dysfunctional marriage or they don't know how to treat their kids, uh, anger, is, anger management is very central to, uh, to pain. People who um, get angry often uh, and intensely and live with this uh, delusion that when they express their anger, they're getting rid of it, uh, typically make their situation much worse. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, I think there's a lot of other issues outside of the pain that affects quality of life. And I think that you can get into these cycles where pain can worsen depression or anxiety or stress can worsen anger, anger can occur. I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into it. So I 100% I agree with that. Yeah, interpersonal therapy is, is very valuable for people who don't have great uh, interpersonal skills. What, what is interpersonal therapy? Sorry. Well, you teach people how to get along better. You know, instead of, instead of calling your kid a, a stupid dumbbell and <laughs> making him feel bad, badly, you, you, uh, say you seem to be having a little trouble with this. Can I help you? Right. Now that makes a lot of sense. I, and, and I know that, you know, since you've been joining our conferences that we have every week, you always remind us when we talk about patients, ask them about their background, right? The family background, how's their marriage, you know, the relationships. So you always point that out. And I find that, I find that very helpful because it really enlightens your understanding of what's going on with that patient. And also how, how, how may they do after surgery? The surgery may go perfectly well. But if they're in a, in a crappy marriage, they're, they're not going to be doing as well as they would do if, they, if, if everything was fine at home. You know, one of my uh, typical case presentations is a husband and a wife who come in for a session together. I often like to do that, especially at the beginning of treatment. And um, I say, well, how's your marriage? And he says, it's great. She's my best friend, my lover. We get along just so great. And she turns to me and says, I don't know who he thinks he's married to, but it's not me. <laughs> and then when I ask them to talk about their most re recent arguments, they look at each other. And although they've been bickering all week, none of them can neither of them can come up with, with what they were arguing about. Now, a few questions about stress. How, how does, why, why does stress make pain worse? What is it? Is it psychological or is it really muscle cramping up? and really causing physical changes that, that, that induce pain? 
Well, st stress is based on a fight or flight me mechanism. You know, whenever we perceive danger, our bodies react automatically. Uh, our heart rate and blood pressure go up, um, preparing us to either fight or flee from the enemy. We secrete lots of adrenaline. Uh, to power our large muscles. We secrete cortisol so that we can see and hear uh, a little bit better. We stop digesting lunch because uh, who needs to digest lunch if you're about to become lunch? So all of these things happen when we're, f when we're truly threatened. But um, if I say to you, uh, good morning, Dr. Hartle, how are you today? And you say to me, I don't have to answer any personal questions. That's uh, a response that indicates that you feel threatened by my asking an emotionally tinged question. And your body will react automatically to that and it will tense up. And if you're a pain patient, it'll likely make your pain worse. Yep, I 100% agree with that too. I think stress is not psychological. I'm not even sure I, I use the word psychological for most things. I think, uh, again, as a neurologist, I think everything is, is happening up here on a, on a chemical hormonal basis. And I think stress, as, as Dr. Allen mentioned, uh, you know, you get this rise in cortisol and adrenaline. And uh, I actually think it makes changes in your brain and also your spine and your muscles. And it adds to all that tension. And again, just amplifies uh, pain that's there. There's a wonderful term called personally relevant stressor. Personally relevant stressor. So some things that bother me might not bother Dr. Hartle or Weaver at all, and, and, and vice versa. We all have certain keen sensitivities. And if somebody challenges that, we perceive it as a threat. And how we deal with that threat, if we deal with it in fight or flight, with, with fight or flight, uh, fight, you know, getting into an argument or fleeing, uh, maybe walking away and leaving a person feeling abandoned, uh, those are not good strategies. People learn how to need to learn how to communicate more effectively and learn how to, most importantly, fill their needs. The hallmark of maturity is the ability to fulfill our needs. Yeah, we have a, a, a number of really good comments and questions uh, about acupuncture, meditation, coping mechanisms, Dr. Sarna, and we'll, we'll talk about all of these. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll, um, may, you, you want to say a few words about acupuncture? Does any, do you guys have any experience with that? I, I personally love acupuncture and I, there's a lot of data on acupuncture. Um, the studies are, are mixed, um, but I think overall, um, you know, when you look at meta-analyses and you look at a lot of these studies, uh, I think acupuncture can work particularly for pain. Um, I use it a lot for nerve pain, um, I send a lot of patients to get acupuncture. Um, I think even, I think in the UK, it's even, um, you know, covered uh, routinely by insurance. Some insurances cover it here in, in America as well. Um, and it's part of first line therapy for, for back pain um, and, and nerve pain. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of it. I think, I think we don't fully understand how physiologically it works, um, but when you stimulate certain areas of the skin or the lymph tissue, I do think that certain, um, that stimulation carries up to the, the spine and the brain and, and probably does create changes over time. Um, you know, we don't understand from a, from a Western medicine perspective, you know, chi lines and, and things like that, uh, that, that acupuncture's philosophy is kind of all about, but um, I do think it works. No, I, I'm I'm a total believer in, in acupuncture for certain types of pain. It may be more related to, to spasms, right? Mm. Muscle spasms. But I, I've had a patient who had severe muscle spasms and the family carried him into the waiting room with severe muscle spasms. And we used to have an uh, acupuncturist uh, on the team for a while, uh, and we still do. We, we have, acu we have uh, somebody who does acupuncture very well in physiatry and sports medicine here. And, and I know that we also refer out to some of the uh, clinicians who do acupuncture, but we used to do clinic for a while with somebody who did acupuncture in clinic. I remember that particular patient had a session and basically walked out with, without any muscle spasms at all. It was quite remarkable, I'll never forget that. So I, I think for certain types of pain, and I look at it more like muscle spasm related pains, maybe that acupuncture may be really valuable. So, uh, uh, so, so, so that, that, that was a great experience. And uh, um, 
there was another question about uh, John Sarno. And uh, let's, let's talk about John Sarno because we have, uh, we, we invited him actually, maybe like 15 years ago, we invited him to give a talk at our conference. And, uh, and it was quite, quite remarkable and patients still talk about his way of approaching pain. He was very, very much opposed to surgery. I remember we had uh, lively discussions and, uh, but clearly he's, he's had a big impact on how, especially here in, in New York, how people think about pain. Any, any, any thoughts, comments, Josh or Robert? Sure, so, so Dr. Sarno was a great believer in pain being generated um, by repressed emotion and in particular anger. Um, he thought that if, if patients were not aware of their emotions, that it would somehow translate physiologically and lead to pain. Um, uh, I have one, one patient I'm working with uh, currently who is a good example of that. She, she was always taught to be a good girl and has enormous difficulty uh, acknowledging the fact that she's in pain. And when she is able to, to figure out that she's angry at her mother for her mother's total insensitivity to her, um, the pain goes away. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, this, this balance between having to be a good girl and being able to acknowledge that I'm angry is, is not a very uncommon situation. Um, also in relationships, you know, in, in, in deep interpersonal relationships, we need to learn how to communicate with our partners, what our needs are, and, and to be able to negotiate for those needs in, in a reasonable and friendly kind of way. Uh, if we can't do that, Sarno would say that our emotions are repressed and they may translate into uh, chronic pain. Yeah, so how I, go oh, sorry, Roger, I was just gonna say, I, I, full disclosure, I have not read uh, Dr. Sarno's books, but I do have multiple patients who have told me um, how helpful it has been to do the, the Sarno method, you know, and read the books and, and really get at this mind-body connection and think about the subconscious and emotional, you know, um, um, issues and how it relates to pain. And I think in theory, I, that, that makes a lot of sense. And the fact that Sarno brought that to light um, is, is a really uh, a powerful thing. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't know what to make of, of Sarno because there's not a lot of uh, research behind it. Um, and I think we don't have objective data to, to look at a particular methodology <laughs> in terms of how this works. But I think anecdotally, a lot of people find that it can be really helpful. So Sarno also um, was most popular 20, 30 years ago before men wore earrings and women had tattoos. You know, these days men are much more conscious of emotions than they used to be. Uh, and women are much more assertive than they used to be. So um, uh, I'm not sure it's quite as relevant these days as it was back 20 years ago. Interesting. Uh, I want to touch on, on, on uh, a few other topics that you guys are very, very knowledgeable about. And uh, I know, I know uh, Dr. Allen, you do a lot of work uh, in regards to anger management. So, so you, you, you showed me this picture earlier. So, so walk us through this. What, what, what is this about? Well, that's obviously a treatment failure, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a great deal of confusion about anger in our society. We tend to think of anger as an accumulating substance kind of like waste products in the body. You know, if we didn't eliminate our waste products, what would happen to us? We would just at a certain point explode. And we have a lot of expressions in, um, in our lexicon that suggests that anger somehow builds up like waste products. We talk about pent up anger. We talk about volcanic anger. We talk about most importantly and most inaccurately, we talk about getting rid of anger. If you think that you're gonna get rid of anger by expressing it in an angry way towards somebody that you love, you, you're, 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 gonna, you're just wrong. Because people typically respond to the anger rather than to the message behind it. And they feel disrespected. So if I say to you, Dr. Hartle, 
I'm X, Y, Z angry at you. And I start yelling at you because you um, were five minutes late today. Uh, you're going to respond. You're going to respond to my anger, not to the message. And that often happens in, uh, in, in uh, interpersonal relationships. It's a very common situation. And there's a, uh, obviously patients in pain, uh, are they more angry? I mean, is that, do, do they develop more anger or is it more the anger that's causing the pain? Or is it, is well, it like it, a vicious circle? Yeah, it's a vicious circle. You know, if, if, you're, if you're in pain um, or when I'm in pain, I tend to be more irritable. And then if I express my irritability in a, um, an unpleasant way, um, do you think my wife's going to say, thank you so much for sharing that? I'm never going to do it again. I know your wife. She's so nice. She's always going to say that. <laughs> thank let's, you. Well, let's so talk. I, let, okay. I, so, I just but want to point what, out one thing, Roger, real quick. Because I, I noticed someone, so there's a couple of comments here about talking about pain being just in your head. And, and I, I think that's, that's unfortunate if, if a doctor tells a patient that, you know, oh, it's all in your head. So, it's, it's, uh, it's worse than unfortunate, it's really terrible. Exactly, and, and I think the point is there are physical pain generators that occur in the body um, and cause the perception of pain. And pain is, as we mentioned before, no matter where the pain is coming from, it's real. Um, but this vicious circle idea, right? So like, the, you know, you have pain and you have emotional response to pain, which can amplify pain. And it just goes back and forth. Whenever I see someone with pain, we of course try to treat it physically. But the, the adjunct to that is you, you also, you need to treat the, the psychological aspects of it, right? Um, because you, you know, you have to break that, that cycle. And, and I think you can attack it in many different ways. And that's the important thing is, is to treat all pain as real and try to figure out where it's coming from. Let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, what we can do and also what we can offer patients in, 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 in the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care to really get their anger and get their pain under control. And uh, I know Josh, you showed us uh, uh, talked a little bit about mind body practices. And I also want to talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy and, and what other more structured treatment uh, algorithms are out there that we can really offer to patients. Maybe Josh, maybe you want to say a few words here? Yeah, well, so I actually, I love this. This is actually part of the, the guidelines, recent guidelines, I think it's 2018 from the American College of Physicians. And one of their one of their recommendations, you know, again, based on data, you know, based on research um, for chronic, for particularly for chronic low back pain, um, there are a lot of non-pharmacologic treatments. And part of what I do when I evaluate people here, um, and, and I think all the doctors, the physiatrists, the pain management doctors, the surgeons bring this up. I mean, everyone here, when we evaluate patients, you know, we, we think about, it's not just sort of a, here's your, here's your uh, Percocet, you know, go home. Um, it's maybe you need medication, fine. Um, and we can talk about that. But we talk about all of these things listed, exercise and rehab, physical therapy, acupuncture. Um, there's this, there's a great, I, know, I think we're going to touch on it a little bit later, but mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, which has actual, you know, decent evidence behind it that it reduces pain. Tai Chi, yoga, all these things as you go through. I mean, there are so many different therapies that are out there. And, you know, we have a lot of resources here and in the community, you know, to, to send people uh, to get these therapies. Um, and I think the biggest thing that, that we do here is, is really look at a patient holistically and, and just figure out what treatments will work best for them on an individual basis. Um, I also just threw in a link there on the side there's a, there's a whole area of the NIH uh, called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which has been funding a lot of research in these non-pharmacologic therapies. And it's a really exciting and, and a promising area. Josh, do you want to say a few words about integrative health at Cornell? Because we work with them very closely, you know, where they are and what they do. Yep. Um, so this is a big passion of mine, integrative health. Um, I, we have an integrative uh, medicine center um, where we have doctors who have been fellowship trained in integrative medicine. And actually, I just finished a two-year fellowship um, in integrative medicine. So I'm sort of joining their ranks as, as one of these providers. But they have a very specific center which just focuses on integrative medicine, which is all of these non-pharmacological therapies. Um, 
they really focus on lifestyle and nutrition and um, you know Eastern medicine, um, Ayurvedic medicine. I mean, there's a whole host of different um, types of, of medical treatment that's there. They have acupuncturists and aromatherapy and massage therapists. Uh, they do MBSR there, the, the mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's a it's a uh, a great place with lots of resources um, to help treat you know the patients we see here in the spine center. Is that something where if you do uh, like aromatherapy, for example, what, what does that maybe walk us through that real quick? What, what does that yeah. mean? Well, aromatherapy, uh, there's there's much less data on on aromatherapy, <clears> but it's, <throat> the idea is that um, you know you you just like you take a pill and uh, you know that medication you know, goes into your bloodstream and, and, you know, affects certain, certain areas of the body. Aromatherapy, the idea is there could be uh, some kind of chemical or a natural substance um, that you're breathing in, and it also enters your bloodstream through that method. Um, so it's, I think of it as a, a, a kind of medication. They've done studies on, for instance, lavender aromatherapy, which all sounds very uh, frou-frou, but I actually think there's a lot of good data for this. They've looked at uh, post-operative patients um, and pain in the post-operative setting. Uh, and they've done you know, uh, studies where they look at people in the post-operative setting having uh, a, a, you know, a diffuser that's, that's putting out uh, lavender-scented aroma in the air, and they find that pain levels go down. You know? And I think there's a, that could be on a chemical basis. It could be just a relaxation uh, basis or a combination of those things. Um, but it's a really interesting area. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I want to uh, talk a little bit about mindfulness-based stress reduction and cognitive behavioral therapy because we we do we we do we do we do this at, at the spine center as well uh, we work with therapists to do this uh dr allen do you want to you want to talk a little bit about this and maybe explain the difference between those two treatment uh sure uh mindfulness based stress reduction is typically um an eight-week program um we we offer one in in uh the Department of Psychiatry, as, as well as Integrative Medicine. Um, and people come there every week and practice being mindful. Well, what does it mean to be mindful? It means really being in the moment. And um, some of the things that you can do to be in the moment, I'm, the, the number one, of course, is meditation, to just sit quietly. And we can't really stop our thoughts, but we can watch them go by and uh, disregard them and focus instead on our bodily sensations. However, if you realize that you forgot to pay the rent and it's overdue and you're gonna get evicted, then you need to take note of that. And after you're done with the, uh, with the class for the day, go home and take care of it. Um, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is usually done in psychotherapy sessions and in conversation with a therapist who, um, if he or she is lucky, can discover thoughts that are depressogenic, uh, making people feel bad, badly, um, generalizations um, that um, uh, make us feel badly, like this, this is uh, the worst thing in the whole world, uh, negative prediction, I'm never going to get better, catastrophizing, you know, my pain is a full-blown catastrophe. Um, and helping people to, um, to uh, identify their negative thoughts. Uh, the two of these are not, um, not completely discrete phenomena. And actually, these days, we talk about mindfulness-based stress reduction along with cognitive behavioral therapy because they, they work uh, to, to reinforce one another. So doing meditation, yoga, tai chi um, uh, are more uh, mindfulness exercises whereas uh, counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy, with or without a workbook, you know, a lot of CBT uses workbooks and sends pay, pe people home to, uh, uh, to actually work on their thought processes like they're studying um, something for school. Hmm. So um, they're both very effective. And in this study, uh, there was essentially no difference in outcome uh, with mindfulness-based stress reduction or cognitive behavioral therapy. And they both improved outcome in uh, chronic back pain patients compared to usual care, which is, you know, regular medical care. Right. Now that's, you know, I, I, 
I put this in here. This was published a few years ago. It's quite remarkable and certainly worthwhile uh, considering uh, for a lot of our patients. It sounds like cognitive behavioral therapy is more one-on-one -on -one and mindfulness may be more like a group therapy. Is that correct? Most likely, yes. Uh, how, how does that work? If somebody wants to do this, would they would they uh, contact you or would that go through Dr. Weaver more or how, 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 how does that work? Uh, well, I would think that um, they can contact me for cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, Dr. Weaver, um, you seem very fond of the integrative uh, medical center at the hospital. So I'm sure you can put people in touch with the uh, uh, MBSR program there. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy for patients to get to get this kind of help wherever they can get it. So, I mean, sending them to the psychiatry department, sending them to integrative medicine, there's actually a lot of, of places in, in New York that uh, provide MBSR. Um, I think I think pre-pandemic it was it was generally done in person uh, with with group classes, um, so it kind of depended on where you were geographically. Um, I think a lot of that is now done over Zoom, um, you know, which I don't know if that's if that works as well or not, but that's that's how it's done these days. Well, certainly, counseling works well on Zoom or FaceTime. Um, since the pandemic started, I've been um, doing all of my work virtually, and I find it um, not terribly different. Hmm. Really. That's good. Uh, thoughts about medical marijuana? Anybody? Well, I, I have lots of thoughts on that. Uh, I actually do uh, prescribe medical marijuana to, to select people. Um, there's a lot of uh, regulations uh, surrounding it. Um, it's, it's you know, uh, part of a New York State program. Um, I think, again, I think medical marijuana, I see as a type of medication. Um, you know, there are all sorts of natural medications and there are medications that were derived originally from natural products and um, I think this is just one of them. It has its, it has its uh, ability to control pain and perhaps distract from pain. Um, it also has other effects on the body. Um, there are the potential for side effects. Um, there is the potential for dependence on it. Um, so I think there's, there's pros and cons to this treatment just like any other treatment. Um, so you know, it is something that I think can help. Um, I don't think it's for everyone, but I do think it's reasonable to consider in a lot of cases. Who, who what type of pain or what, who is a good candidate for this type of treatment? So it's actually, uh, unfortunately, different state by state. Um, so for New York State, there are specific diagnoses that can qualify you for medical marijuana. Chronic pain is one of them. And they don't specify what type of pain. It could be joint pain, uh, it could be muscle pain, it could be nerve pain, um, you know, anywhere in the body if it's chronic uh, pain. Generally, the way I view it is, um, you know, it, it's not first line therapy, there's not a lot of data behind it, we don't know the optimal dosing or any of that kind of stuff. So I generally want people to have tried, you know, uh, other methods of pain control uh, that have more data behind them. And if that doesn't really seem to be working, then I think medical marijuana is reasonable to, to consider. Dr. Allen, any thoughts about CBD uh, or medical marijuana? I have a few patients who benefit from medical marijuana. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have much to add what, beyond what Dr. Weaver said. Right. Well, we're slowly coming to, uh, to the end of our webinar here. I, 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 wanna, I wanna ask one last question for uh, Dr. Allen. Now, Dr. Allen, apart from being a, a world-class psychologist, he's also an expert and an accomplished pianist. And uh, everybody who's listened to his music knows that uh, it's incredibly calming and it's, it's enjoyable. What, what, what do you think about music and pain? Is there any role for music therapy or? Uh, absolutely, listening to calming music. I mean, there's a, a ton of uh, calming music out there. Um, I think it's very, um, very soothing and, and, and it can distract you from your pain. And certainly when I'm playing, uh, I ignore my pain completely. <laughs> I thought you didn't have any pain since you've been working with us. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a request for you to play for us, uh, Dr. Allen. <laughs> if anybody's interested in my music, I'd be happy to send you a link. Love it. Yeah, that's, that's, 
Yeah, those great comments in the chat box. I really uh, uh, appreciate that. And uh, uh, so we're we, we at the end. I think we should uh, finish up. Uh, we do this every two weeks. It's always very enjoyable. It's uh, the preparation is great, and the actual event is always great. And uh, please uh, come back in two weeks. I think uh, I think we're going to talk about sport and spine. I think so. But you'll 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 get the emails, and uh, we have many other topics coming up. If you have any ideas or any, any thoughts that what we should cover, uh, you should certainly let us know. And uh, Josh, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank Dr. You. Alan, same to you, Robert. Thank have you great so much evening. for the opportunity to collaborate with you, Roger. Thank of course. You. Yeah. Nice, nice to work with you, Josh. You do. Okay. Be well, everybody. Stay safe and uh, hope uh, we uh, distracted you a little bit from, uh, from the election. So. And Bye -bye. from your pain. And from your pain, more importantly, pain. yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.